Super Bowl Sunday, and the only reason I mention that, because our religion is not football, our religion is the God of heaven and earth, but the only reason I mention that is to tell you that it kind of is. Uh, we're going to, uh, my, my small group that meets at 6 o'clock normally, uh, on Sunday afternoons, on this first Sunday, is going to meet at 5 o'clock uh, because I want to watch the Super Bowl. And I think it's only fair that we get to watch the Super Bowl. And so if you want to be here at six or at 5 o'clock this afternoon, we'll be meeting back in the chapel, and uh, we will worship together. You know, one of the most... One of the most impressive things about living in southeastern New Mexico, I think, was the night sky. Re really living in Maljamar. Uh, if you don't know where Maljamar is, you, you need to go off the cap and see where Maljamar is. Because Maljamar is this little village of about 300 people. And there are no streets there. There are highway, a couple of highways that go through town. One, one county road, maybe a state road, and one, one U.S. highway. But uh, there are no street lights. A few porch lights here and there, but but no no street lights. And so, when you get out there with the New Mexico weather, uh, it is cloudless, it is clear, it is pure. The night sky was amazing. Just billions upon billions of stars. I knew what the Milky Way was. I didn't have to guess where the Milky Way was. I mean, it shined like the sun almost. Uh, on the moonless nights during the summer, we would lay out on some sand hill and we would just gaze at the sky. And once in a while, you know, maybe a meteor would streak by, a falling star, a shooting star. Occasionally, we would see a satellite racing across in the foreground. But there was something magical. There was something limitless. There was, there was something boundless and fascinating about that glorious star-spangled sky. And I grew up loving astronomy. One of the first books I ever bought with my own money was a paperback book called The Universe by Isaac Asimov. And in it were photographs of deep space. There were photographs of the Horsehead Nebula. Uh, there were photographs of galactic clusters. There were photographs of even of supernovas. And, and I almost shuddered when I learned about the immense distances from one place to another in the universe. And, and the untold millions and billions of years light has been traveling through the void of space. And I caught a glimpse of all of those innumerable, indescribable, uncountable places that, where things were happening that I never really knew anything about. I, 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 I just, there was just something in it. There was something in it that really expanded my soul. I, I could feel the glory of creation. I, I, I could almost touch the majesty of this God who was so great that he created all these incredible things and, and who could somehow encompass all of this incredible distance and this incredible length of time. There was something about it that made me want to experience more, what it, that made me want to see more and know more. And after a night of watching the stars, I found that I read more books. I, I, I got more out of school, at least for a while, and then it was time to go back to the hills and to stare at the stars once again. And, and even today, once in a while, you may come into my office and I will be stargazing uh, because it recharges my soul and it just kind of draws, my, my, draws me closer on the inside, expands me as I get closer to God somehow. I, isn't it sad that though we... Though we have such wonderful gifts, these things from God that are meant to grow us and expand us and to, to make us feel wider and freer, isn't it sad that we waste such wonderful things in the pursuit of trivia? And, and instead of experiencing the, the eternal, we, we submerge ourselves in passing moments as though we're going to miss something in the, in the moment, in this emergency right here. I, I watch young people who are desperate to have a good time. Uh, as though, you know, if they can just feel some intense pleasure, some rush, then life is going to be worthwhile. And so they, they dabble in sex. And some of them get hooked on porn. And some of them seduce men and women. And, and this wonderful God-given gift of sexuality 
meant to be experienced in a secure, nurturing, expanding way, encountering another and giving exclusively to another. This, this gift that is meant to really expand our souls and, and make us larger and more powerful gets all shriveled up. And sex just kind of becomes a thing of pursuing pleasure faster and faster. And, and, and sex is about judging one another rather than finding acceptance. And it gets all turned inward about how I feel instead of a growing relationship. And, and it becomes this desperate search for something. Some of them, I, I watch, drown themselves in alcohol or they fog their minds with marijuana as though drinking a beer makes life worth living. And... And I know they're looking to be more sociable and more entertaining and funnier and happier. And, and they find out that they are sick and they're irritating and problems are just kind of oozing out the walls at them. And I was watching a report the other day on ESPN about sexual assaults on college campuses. And, and listen to the young women they were interviewing. And these young women had been traumatized by their experiences. I, I mean, their psyches and their lives have been mangled by what had happened to them. And it, and it was infuriating to watch how these colleges sometimes step in and get in the way and, and save these young men from the consequences of their action. These young men who, who, who did it that ought to be brought to justice and ought to, be, ought to have to, to pay for what they have done. And yet I noticed that there was a common theme in every single one of the stories as they interviewed these young women. She would say something like this, I was at a party and I started drinking and I passed out, and when I woke up, and it was just tragedy. Isn't it sad that we take such good gifts and we just mangle them? Isn't it sad that we take marriage, clearly, from biblical teaching, the second chapter of Genesis, a gift from God, meant to be a fulfillment I mean, here is Adam created all alone, and God said it is not good that he be alone. He created Eve, and they come together, and there is a wholeness now to human beings. There is a coupling that is meant to, to, to expand our hearts and to make our lives grow bigger and more powerful. And personally, as we learn to nurture and care for each other, it kind of widens out to our children and, and their children and on down through the generation. Isn't it sad that we take that institution and we just kind of crumble it all up and shrivel it all up and wad it all up bickering with one another and chipping away at one another and blaming one another and undermining one another so that so many marriages far from being that growing and expanding gift they become places where you can just barely breathe you can barely catch your breath and barely stretch becoming confining and claustrophobic and, and demeaning. There, there's so many blessings like that. We, we have scripture. We have parents who have tried to raise us to know better. We have a church full of people who are holding us accountable and who are demonstrating for us how to live the Christ life and, and who try to encourage us and build us up. And still, still somehow we persist in focusing not on the majesty of God and how blessed life can be in Christ Jesus, but we try to find our happiness in things that are just too small to satisfy and too small to expand us and we just get all cramped. We turn inward and we just kind of shrink our vision and shrivel up our imagination until we, are, we, we, we live these claustrophobic, desperate lives and we, we, we seek fulfillment in all sorts of sinful things and we're wondering and crying and complaining about why we can't find freedom and why we can't find happiness and why we can't find this or can't find that. And Isaiah says, this is what the Lord says, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am Yahweh, your God, who teaches you what is best for you, who directs you in the way you should go. If only you had paid attention to my commands, your peace would have been like a river your well-being like the waves of the sea. Your descendants would have been like the sand. Your children like its numberless grains. Their names would never be blotted out nor destroyed from before me. And, and I don't hear God in that prophecy, that passage, as he talks to his people. I don't hear him angry and threatening. I, I don't hear him blustering and deadly. But instead, I hear him pleading. 
mystified that these people he has called into this wonderful relationship and given them such wonderful guidance and, and shown them how to have lives that really are lives of meaning and purpose, lives that will be full of every good thing, lives that just you're just going to feel like you can breathe and breathe big. Instead, they have turned to this shriveled, dried up existence. And the Lord says, there is no peace for the wicked. And yet it, isn't, it isn't as easy as doing the right thing. I, most of us know the right thing to do. We, we know we ought to do better than we do. We know we ought to be involved in things. We know we ought to, we ought to accomplish greater things than we do. But the problem is we just can't get ourselves to do the right thing. Uh, at least for not as long as doing the right thing often takes. You know, we might start off well, uh, but something seems to happen to us that causes us to take our eyes off the, the exalted, expansive glory of possibilities and, and just plunge ourselves back into these limited, choking, drowning, constricted lives of sin. Philosophers call it angst. Uh, the word angst, A-N-G-S-T, the word angst literally means anxiety or fear. It comes from words in Latin that mean tense or tight or clenched or choking. Uh, it, it ultimately comes from a Greek word that means to strangle. And it, it's that angst is that restricted, choking feeling that you get because you're afraid life isn't going to turn out to be everything you hoped it would be that your life is not going to have any meaning or that you're not going to be as wealthy as you wanted to be or you're going to grow old and not have enough to make it to the end or that no matter what you do, nothing is going to work out for good, that really you aren't going to get what you think you deserve. And, and, and so we start flailing around in our fear, looking for solutions, trying to find true happiness. But usually, usually investing ourselves only in things that never satisfy, things that may give us a charge for a moment or two, but then are used up, things that, that we enjoy for a short time and then they just kind of disappear. But everything always falls short and we wind up feeling strangled and squeezed, victims instead of victors. And that's really the problem that Israel faced in the days of Isaiah. They, poverty, war, famine, uh, their families falling apart, uh, injustice on every hand, being uprooted and hauled off into exile. Israel's life is just characterized by fear. They are afraid of the Babylonians. They are afraid of each other. They are afraid of hunger. They are afraid in virtually every dimension of their lives that you can imagine. Fear grips them and just holds their heart tight and is squeezing the life out of them. And so they've turned to all sorts of things to try to alleviate their fear. They, you, you can read Isaiah. They've turned to money. They've turned to sex. They've turned to booze. They've turned to political power. They've turned to social status. They've turned to partying. But the, the, the whole picture you get of this entire society is just a bunch of people who are absolutely miserable. And God's message to them through Isaiah is partly true. Look at the mess you've gotten yourself into. But mostly the message is, you know, the only way out of this mess is to stop being afraid. And the only way to stop being afraid is to stop trusting in yourselves and start trusting in God. But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I chosen, you descendants of Abraham, my friend, I took you from the ends of the earth. From its farthest corners, I called you. I said, you're my servant. I have chosen you and have not rejected you. So do not fear, for I'm with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. All who rage against you will surely be ashamed and disgraced. Those who oppose you will be as nothing and perish. Though you search for your enemies, you'll not find them. Those who wage war against you will be as nothing at all. For I am the Lord your God, who takes you hold of your right hand and says to you, Do not fear, I will help you. Do not be afraid, you worm, Jacob. Little Israel, do not fear, for I myself will help you, declares the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. 
do we really have to be convinced that we ought not to trust in ourselves? I mean, we know our limitations. We know the mess we can make out of things. We know how little power we have to actually affect things. I mean, even when we know it's bad, and just a, something as simple, for example, as biting your fingernails, and you know I need to stop biting my fingernails for whatever reason, and it's almost impossible. I mean, we have that little power most of the time. But have you noticed how much it takes for us to actually admit it? It isn't until we are stomped and folded and spindled and mutilated that we are in any sort of shape to finally be able to turn loose of ourselves and to trust God. Usually the process that God has to follow is, is not simply to reveal himself to us through the gospel. Here I am, lovely, majestic, powerful, everything you could possibly imagine, everything you could possibly need, and it is a I remember one time when Lynette and I took off on a trip and my mother talked us into leaving David Sumner when he was just tiny with her uh, for the weekend while we were gone. And, and she said, now don't get him upset. You guys get up and leave early in the morning before he gets up and then he'll be fine. You know, she just didn't want to deal with him crying is what the problem was. And so we came back after three or four days and David Sumner was in the middle of the floor and he was playing and having a big time. And Lynette came bursting in with her heart full of you know, everything that, that firstborn mothers have in their hearts. David! And he said, then he went back to whatever he was doing. And God appears to us and he says, here I am. And we look and we go back to whatever it is we were doing. Usually what God has to do if he really cares about us and doesn't want to give up on us is he has to dismantle us stick by stick, cell by cell, until finally we're just a blubbering pile of splinters out there. And then when we finally realize I can't help myself, and when we have nowhere else to turn, then we turn to God. Isn't it true that we learn almost all the important things in the tough times. There was an episode on PBS about, uh, or the NPR radio, uh, it was on PBS radio station, uh, This American Life, focused on a young woman named Sarah who was sharing her story of her family. She, she had grown up in this privileged family. Uh, they had an enormous house. They, had, they wore beautiful clothes. They went to expensive schools. They had a country club membership at some of the most exclusive country clubs in the country. Notice how I said that, not a, an exclusive membership, but exclusive membership. Uh, both her mom and dad drove brand new Porsches and got new ones every year. Uh, her mom decked herself out with beautiful jewelry. Uh, jewelry. Sarah's dad was this upwardly mobile lawyer, well-connected. But despite all of the signs of their success, her home life was just marked by constant pressure to keep up the family image. Sarah said, rules are very important. Uh, etiquette, really important. And you know, usually when people are feeling out of control, they start making rules. That's the way we kind of try to get back in control. And, and here's this family. You begin to feel like something is really going haywire in this family because they're just being restricted and squeezed with one rule after another, after another, after another. She says, my dad's insane temper could be set off by the slightest offense. When I heard the Porsche rumble up to the driveway every day when he came home, I would run into my room and hide because maybe this would be the day he found a candy wrapper laying on the sofa. And it was all about, she said, it was all about not stirring up the bee's nest. But then in 1990, all that came to a screeching halt. And Sarah described the day when her parents called a family meeting to tell the children that her father had done something very wrong and was going to have to pay. Uh, much of their money, it turned out, had been made by him embezzling a trust fund of one of his disabled clients. And she said, my father wept on the couch as he confessed his wrongdoing to his children. And he said, we're going to have to start completely over. We're going to have to rebuild our lives. And her father was disbarred from practicing law, and they had to sell their beautiful home and their Porsches. They had to, uh, all their family, friends disowned them. She said, my mom had to find a job. And she went to work changing sheets at a nursing home and serving as a janitor at a church where eventually they be began to go to church. 
And she says, and yet, in the midst of all of this, this death, the death of security and wealth and achievement and identity, this, this, a, a wonderful new life was born. Sarah said, my dad instantly became better. He was happy. He chewed gum, which didn't happen before. It was apparently a big deal to her. She said, he wasn't such a jerk all the time. And mom, her transformation was amazing. She, she packaged bag lunches for us. She, she fed homeless people who lived under a bridge. She went to Rwanda during the genocide. And she said she even let a homeless guy named Earl live with us once. He was a fugitive. And, and we figured it out later. But the way she ended the story was to say, but who are we to judge? Well, yeah, yeah okay, now she knows. But doesn't that, isn't that what it takes for us oftentimes to get our attention and to learn what's really important to kind of boil us down? God says to Israel in Isaiah, and I don't have this passage written down, and I can't remember the, the exact place that it's found, but he says, I purified you through your affliction. I didn't do it to destroy you. I did it to purify you. And that's what it takes. God says, after all of that, stripping these people down to the bare minimum, stripping us sometimes down to, the, to where we can hardly move, God says then, now can you hear me? Do not be afraid, you worm Jacob, little Israel. And I don't think God is trying to insult his people. I think these people, this is what their people are saying about themselves. We're worms, we're, we're just little Israel. Don't fear, for I myself will help you declares Yahweh, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Now will you turn to me? Now will you hear me? Will you listen to my rebuke and my warning? Will you trust me? And the question is, can we trust God? And we say, well, sure we can. We know that. We can trust God. But it's a little bit more difficult. It's, it's easy to say. It's, it's quite a bit more difficult to live it and to stand on it and to put our weight on it. Here's Israel, mired in this foreign country, away from home. They've been away for a long time, 50 or 60 years. Home didn't seem like home anymore. I, I talked about Maljamar because that's where I spent most of my childhood, most of my growing up. And, and I go back there once in a while, and I look around, and I remember things, and I reminisce about what's changed and what hasn't changed. But I don't want to live there. That's not my home anymore. That's not where I belong. I moved away, and I've lived other places. And, and I've now lived here longer than I've lived ever in Maljamar. Think about how hard it was for the Israelites to maintain their faith and their sense of the promised land and their sense of God in this foreign world where they had grown up and maybe even grown to love the people or the culture or they just kind of grown comfortable in it. Well, I, you know, they weren't really so comfortable. They were still prisoners of war. They were still refugees. They were still foreigners. They were still outsiders, and they were, they were treated like second-class citizens. But maybe their visions were, you know, they, they were filled with visions of home, of the promised land, and I'm sure they idealized the promised land. Boy, when we get there, it's going to be great. But reality reigns. We aren't there. We're here. And we aren't happy about it, but what can you do? I, I, you know, there's this tension between knowing what ought to be and what really is. And I know that life ought to be full of joy and full of courage and fulfillment and all of that good stuff, but I am struggling with cancer or poverty or my spouse is giving me grief or my kids are driving me crazy or my job is dull and difficult. It is so easy to lose hope and to lose faith. God isn't who I thought he was. God isn't capable of what I thought he was. God must not be as powerful or as good or as involved as I thought he might be. And we don't really lose hope in the sense that we consciously do it. We just kind of don't think about it a lot. I just do what gets me by, live day to day, doing what I do, going where I go, shopping where I shop. If it's Christian, okay, but if it's not Christian, that's all right, too. I just do what gets me by. Israel, like a lot of us, had lost their vision. They had, their, their imagination had shrunk. And rather than being the people of God, rather than being light in the world, and rather than being the leaders, rather than being a sign of God's majesty and goodness, their religion has just shriveled, shriveled up into this little choking strangling incoherent inconvenience 
The Lord has to catch their eye. The Lord has to do something to kind of get them involved again and get them thinking again and get them feeling again. And he says, listen to me in silence, O coastlands. I've got the RSV there. Be silent before me, you islands. Let the nations renew their strength. Let them come forward and speak. Let us meet together at the place of judgment. Who has stirred up one from the east, calling him in righteousness to his service? He has handed, or he hands nations over to him and subdues kings before him. He turns them to dust with his sword, to windblown shaft with his bow. He pursues them and moves on unscathed by a path his feet have not traveled before. Who has done, done this and carried it through, calling forth the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, with the first of them and with the last, I am he. Now, let me tell you what's going on here in those verses and why I, I bring those out. Isaiah is writing his prophecy somewhere around 700 B.C. He is writing during the reigns of Ahaz and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. And while he is writing his prophecy, God brings up this, this idea of a victor from the east. And the reason he does this is to contrast himself, to contrast God to the lifeless idols. And he claims the difference between me and these idols is that I actually do something. And what I do is I control the future. He says, present your case, says the Lord. Set forth your arguments, says Jacob's king. Tell us, you idols, what's going to happen? Tell us what the former things were so that we may consider them and know their final outcome. Or declare to us the things to come. Tell us what the future holds so that we may know that your gods do something, whether good or bad, so that we will be dismayed and filled with fear. You're less than nothing, and your works are utterly worthless. Whoever chooses you is detestable. I have stirred up one from the north, and he comes from the rising sun who calls on my name. He treads on rulers as if they were mortar, as if he were a parlor treading the clay. Who told of this from the beginning so we could know, or beforehand so we could say he was right? No one told of this. No one foretold it. No one heard any words from you. I was the first to tell Zion, look, here they are. I gave to Jerusalem a messenger of good news. What he is claiming, what Yahweh, what God is claiming there is not just to predict the future. I can tell you what's going to happen next, but he is claiming to control the future. He is bringing it about. He has not just predicted it as though he can look ahead and see what's going to happen. You know, it just happens all by itself. But he forms the future. He makes it happen. And what he tells about is a ruler named Cyrus who will conquer Babylon and send the Israelites back to their homeland. This is what the Lord says. Your Redeemer who formed you in the womb, I am the Lord, the maker of all things, who stretches out the heavens, who spreads out the earth by myself, who, who foils the signs of false prophets and makes fools of diviners, who overthrows the learning of the wise and turns it into nonsense, who carries out the words of his servants and fulfills the predictions of his messengers, who says of Jerusalem, it shall be inhabited, of the towns of Judah they shall be rebuilt, and of their ruins I will restore them, who says to the watery deep, be dry and I will dry up your streams, who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and will accomplish all that I please. He will say of Jerusalem, let it be rebuilt, and of the temple, let its foundations be laid. Who told of the, uh, I'm sorry, I got behind again. Now, remember when this was written. This was written in 700 B.C. by Isaiah the prophet. Babylon, under Nebuchadnezzar, destroyed the city of Jerusalem in 587 B.C., about 130 years later. A little over, you know, a little over 100 years later than Isaiah. Isaiah writes, Nebuchadnezzar comes along and destroys the city about 100 years later. Babylon was a powerful empire that conquered almost all the known world. Uh, it, its main competition was this little tribe of, of shepherds from the east, uh, the northeast of Babylon called the Medes. But the Medes mostly were in irritation. They weren't even strong enough to, to give Babylon a run for their money. But somewhere along about 550 B.C., after the destruction of Jerusalem, a minor leader from a minor tribe associated with the Medes became king of his tribe. Uh, this man's mother was a daughter of the, the king of the Medes, but uh, this fellow was a, a king of this little nothing tribe out here in the middle of nowhere, poor, 
uh, struggling. They were, they were just not much. But somehow or other, he persuaded his tribe that the Medes were wronging them, and he revolted against the Medes. And against the odds, he defeated them in one battle after another and became king of the Medes and then styled himself king of Persia. He rapidly flexed his muscle and he conquered the kingdom of Croesus and Lydia in vicious battle. And then he captured the empire of Babylon, this powerful empire of Babylon. He captured it without, almost without firing a shot, about four, 540 B.C. He moved so quickly that it was said his feet didn't touch the ground. I mean, he was just moving from here to here to here, conquering this and this and this. In 538 B.C., after he conquered Babylon, he then issued a decree that all the Israelites could leave Mesopotamia, they could leave Babylon, and they could return to their homeland and rebuild the temple. And the ruler's name was Cyrus the Great. And don't miss what I'm telling you, because this is, this is powerful stuff. Isaiah writes in 700 B.C., and he does not just simply say, oh, some great ruler is going to arise and he's going to rescue my people and maybe Jerusalem will be built. He specifically names somebody, Cyrus. He will be the one who rescues my people. And 150 years later, lo and behold, who comes to the throne and does exactly what God has said will happen but Cyrus the Great. Lucky guess, right? God says, I am the first and I am the last. This is what the Lord says, Israel's King and Redeemer, the Lord Almighty. I am the first and I am the last. Apart from me, there is no God who is like me. Let him proclaim it. Let him declare it and lay out before me what has happened since I established my ancient people and what is yet to come. Yes, let them foretell what will come. You see, the creative power of God that God demonstrates in the very beginning is still the creative power that marks him as the God of heaven and earth. This is his power to bring meaning out of chaos. This is his power to make everything out of nothing. This is his power to take your life and whatever circumstances reign in your life, whether good or bad, and to take those, no matter how fouled up they might be, and, and use all of those evil ingredients, nothing, to accomplish your joy and your happiness. You understand that faith in Christ is not about what human beings can do and think and determine and will. But faith in Christ is about supernatural power. And it's about supernatural patience. And it's about supernatural endurance and supernatural accomplishment. Faith in Jesus is about miracles. We downplay that so much that we forget that that's an important part of what we believe about God, that he actually does things, not necessarily the miracles of speaking in tongues or even an instantaneous healing, but certainly the, me the, the miracles of healing human hearts and making human lives worth living and empowering human beings to, to, to accomplish things far beyond what anyone ever expects. It is about the miracles of God. Paul will talk about the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. And what he is implying and trying, what he's trying to tell us is, and that is the power that is at work in you as well. Three points real quickly at the end. Number one, trust him because he's able to bless you. The poor and the needy search for water, but there is none. Their tongues are parched with thirst, but I, the Lord, will answer them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will make rivers flow on barren heights and springs within the valleys. I will turn the desert into pools of water and the parched ground into springs. I will put in the desert the cedar and the acacia, the myrtle and the olive. I will set junipers in the wasteland, the fir and the cypress together so that people may see and know, may consider and understand that the hand of the Lord has done this, that the Holy One of Israel has created it. Trust Him because He wants to bless you what the Lord says, the creator of the heavens, who stretches them out, who spreads out the earth with all that springs from it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I'll take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord. 
That is my name. I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. Trust him because he will bless you in every way. Now, this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, don't fear. I have redeemed you. I've summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Have you read the book of Revelation? A book that, that really doesn't pull any punches about the power of, of, and the persecution of the Roman Empire. The Christians are living in fear. They are oppressed. They are confused. They cry out, how long, sovereign Lord? How long? And in John, uh, John in Revelation 1 meets Jesus, a mighty figure, dressed like a priest with the wisdom of eternity sketched on his face, eyes that burn into you like blazing fire, eyes that miss no injustice and penetrate to the very soul and heart of everything and every person. He walks in boots that leave tracks with blood of his enemies trailing behind. He speaks with a voice like the roaring of a waterfall. Nobody would ever say, what was that? When Jesus speaks, and when I saw him, John says, I fell at his feet, though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I live forever, or I am alive forever and ever. I hold the, de the keys of death and Hades. And then you have all of the guts of the book. The power of Satan to maim and destroy and, and the power of Rome to command and to deceive and to mistreat the faithful and the innocent. Armies clashing and fires burning and, and smoke everywhere and blood flowing as high as the bridles of horses. Dead people lying all over. And then at the end, the people of God envisioned like a bride, not wounded and hurt, not torn and, you know, dressed in torn clothes and bloody clothes, but but a bride coming down from heaven, ready for her wedding day. And you know how beautiful every bride always is. And Jesus says, look, I'm coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Let's stand and sing. If you need to come to Jesus this morning, would you please come?